was a Saturday morning, and I know I remember it pretty vividly. Um, within a couple hours, the three of us were all on planes headed to um, rural East Texas. I know the thing I, I remember most about first arriving on on the ground in East Texas is as soon as we left the airport and got on the highway, I was driving in my rental car and the digital amber alert sign said, if you find pieces of the shuttle, call the police. And it was just so surreal. Yeah, I, I remember uh, an hour or so south of Dallas, uh, we passed some spot that was, uh, was taped off with ribbons indicating that uh, a piece had been found there. And we were like, holy cow, you can actually see it from the road. But the farther and deeper we got into the area, we realized that was the case everywhere. Debris was laying in parking lots, it was laying on school fields and ranches. It was, it was just, uh, you could not see it. 89,000 pieces were recovered, and that was the latest count. And I know that number is still going up slowly. We came across a shuttle mission instruction manual, and it was the size of a phone book, and it was laying out in the forest. It wasn't scorched, it wasn't burnt. It wasn't even very damaged. Yeah, the thing I remember was, was the mobilization of local people to go out and, and search for the debris. Um, I remember the school buses full of people, start in the morning, uh, fan out, look. And I know from talking to people that there was this kind of sense of um, you wanted to find something, uh, but then you also dreaded that, that what you might find wasn't, wasn't a piece of metal, but a, but a piece of, a, of, a, of one of the astronauts. Whenever they found a, uh, uh, a remain, there was uh, a team of four people. The FBI agent was there for investigative purposes. The local police officer was for security. The chaplain would always say some kind of a prayer. And then the astronaut was there to represent the family, kind of this brotherhood of NASA. I think everybody uh, kept top of mind the fact that seven astronauts had, in fact, lost their lives. And remarkably, although we were finding these enormous pieces of shuttle on the ground, nobody on the ground was hurt. Yeah, that was, uh, that was the, the, the amazing thing. And, and I know I, I, I talked to some religious leaders that thought that that was miraculous, um, some you know, act of God, that that many pieces would fall and nobody would, would be hurt. You know, a lot of the people there, when you talk to them today, the thing that they remember, because all, all these pieces fell and it all, it all happened so suddenly, and the, the thing that they remember is the sonic boom that woke, yes. woke a bunch of them up out of bed. And it wasn't and so much a sonic boom. From what I gather, it was a long rumble. Okay. You know, when we hear the sonic boom, we're used here, to a sonic they boom. Go boom, boom. Right. And the people who described this said it lasted 20, 30 seconds long, and it was a very low, deep rumble. And uh, it shook their homes. It shook their homes. It, sh it shook things inside their homes, and a lot of them got out of bed and went and looked outside. And and a couple people I talked to remember um, looking up and actually seeing the plumes of smoke. And that's the the thing about Columbia is it was so intensely personal for so many people. Challenger, I think, really gripped the nation, and a lot of people witnessed the Challenger explosion. But Challenger broke up over the ocean. And when the Columbia tragedy happened, it broke, down, it broke up over Texas and parts of Louisiana. And it was in people's yards and, and all over um, you know, businesses. And, and people took that um, you know, really personally.